Good evening, Doc. Good evening. Yes, we are live on True Life Reflection of an African Child. It's good to have you on the program today. Thank you so much. Thank you. you. Yes, thank you for accepting my invitation to share your live reflection for, with African youth. Good evening, viewers. We are live once again. This program is meant to inspire young African youth around the world. And basically, we want to inspire young African youth who are struggling to make it in one way or the other. And we share our life stories here, and we hope that you pick out something if you are so struggling to pick to get entrepreneurship or any education, any aspect of life that you want to go. And so basically, this program, we share our life stories, hoping that it, is, it will inspire an African youth somewhere. And so with me today is Dr. Sunkari, if I'm right, the name is right, and uh, he will share with us his life story. So we are to hear a lot from him. Uh, let's keep going. Please introduce yourself to us. All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Veronica Kuma. Uh, actually, my name is Emmanuel Danuba Sunkari. I hail from Jang in the Naduli Kalio district in the Upper West region of Ghana. And uh, actually, I grew up in Wa all throughout my life. I had my secondary education and everything over there in the Upper West region. And so that is who I am. I come from the Upper West region. And currently, I'm a lecturer at the Department of Geological Engineering of the University of Mines and Technology, Takwa. So that's the little I can wow. talk about myself. Yes, we have heard now you are in the uh, University of Mines and Technology. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. It's very nice to hear this, that uh, looking at you, you look very young, and you are already a lecturer at the university. Uh, Many of us, many African youth are struggling to get to where you are now. And maybe your story, like how you started and how you have managed to be where you are today will inspire someone. So we would like to hear more about you. Tell us about your basic education, those kind of stuff to, to where you are now. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much. Yes. So the beginning of everything, I always tell my friends, uh, cannot be vividly you know, depicted. You can't tell the exact times things happen, except you are somebody who take critical notice of what happens in your life. But basically, I can say that I started my basic school in Wa at St. Andrew's Day Nursery, I think around the year 1996 or so. And then from the Day Nursery, I went to the primary school of the same school, St. Andrew's Roman Catholic Primary School, is at Kunta, as we know, in Wa. And then I proceeded to the junior high school. Uh, then it was junior secondary school. And uh, over there, I may have to talk about certain things. I was the agricultural prophet, agriculture. Yeah, if you may take it that way. Actually, I applied to be the senior high, I mean, senior prophet, but something happened. I don't know. According to sources, I won. But there were a lot of, you know, arguments. But in fact, I didn't get it. But later on, they gave me the agri prophet. So I became the agri prophet of St. Andrews. And then from there, I proceeded to Nandom Secondary School, which is now Nandom Senior High School, popularly known Yes, as Doc, please. Thank you very much. Could you give me a little break to cheer up my viewers? Thank you, viewers, for joining. Bramak, I've seen you. And I've seen uh, Bill resorted. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining. If you are joining, please send us high for us to know that you have joined. You can tell us where you are watching from. And just listen to you. If you have any question for doctor, you can also send it as well. Thank you for joining. Please share the program, like, and follow as well. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's continue, Doc. All right. So I, I got to Nandom Secondary School. I went there in the year 2005. In fact, we were the first computer babies. As you may know, in the year 2005, the computerized system of selection of students who wrote BCE who were the first, who, I mean, they tested the system with. So uh, you may have heard that some people were even posted to, you know, girl schools when they are boys. It happened to some of my mates. So luckily on my part, I got my first choice, which was Nandom Secondary School. And I went there. At Nandom Sec, I was the assistant senior prophet. I was also a debater. In fact, uh, my name became a household name in uh, the Upper West region because of debating. 
because I, I was a strong debater. I was even debating for the region and against, you know, the almighty St. Francis Xavier minor seminary. Yes. And then from, I mean, at Nandom Sec, I studied general science. Initially, I went to study arts. But I don't know. Maybe I will talk about that later. But let me just tell you the trajectory of my academic life. So I studied general science. And then from Nandom Secondary School, I proceeded to the University for Development Studies in Abrongo campus, uh, which is now CKT, uh, University of Technology and Applied Sciences. Yeah, over there, I studied a four-year Bachelor of Science degree in Earth Science, which is like geology. And uh, after that, I was called back as a, an assist, I am teaching assistant because of the dint of my hard work. They called me as a teaching assistant. That is for my national service. So I did my service there for one year uh, and ended in the year 2014. I completed 2018 and 2014, I did a service. And then in the year 2015, I think the grace of God fell upon me and I got a scholarship to study in Turkey. And uh, I was given a full scholarship for both masters and PhD. So I left Ghana in the, the year 2015 and went to Turkey and then I studied my master's, finished in 2017, and then continued with a PhD. And today I find myself back to Ghana, where I came from, as a lecturer at the University of Mines and Technology, Takwa. Thank you. Wow, what an interesting story. Yes. Uh, your life is definitely an inspiration to many of us. and. I don't know. You are really very lucky. I don't know whether you were born lucky or something like that because getting full scholarship for both masters and PhD is, is, is very interesting to know this. Yes. Uh, I know sometimes uh, many African youth are looking for such opportunities and possibly they don't even know how to get some of these opportunities. So maybe we'll get there. You tell us how you got this scholarship later on. Okay. And uh, so... It seems like, um, if I may say, you were born quite intelligent because everything went on very smoothly. No repetition, no nothing <laughs> of that sort. Lovely viewers, sorry. <laughs> if you are joining, please send us hi for us to know that you have joined. Let us know that you are part of this program. Memuna, uh, I've seen you, Caesar. Uh, Prince, I've seen you. Thank you for joining. My brother Mike, I've seen you. Thank you for joining. Um, something, I don't know. Thank you for joining. I've seen you. Thank you, everyone, for joining this program. I appreciate everything you are saying and being part of the program. So let's continue, Doc. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you didn't encounter challenges when you were going through your educational life, if I may say. Did you? Well, in fact, it is impossible for one to say you didn't go through any challenges in life, you know, with regard to education or any aspect of your life. I went mm. through challenges. The only thing is that I was never repeated or I never sat in one class for a long period of time. I went through all the stages smoothly, but it wasn't easy because, in fact, I come from a very poor background. If I tell you my story, Sometimes when I'm teaching my students, I begin to tell them my story and I, I become teary because there were even instances where I had to, you know, uh, how do you call it? Look for bags, you know, a bag just to put my books. It was so difficult. Sometimes I had to go to the baller very close to, I was staying at Doble Locos, if you know there. In yeah, Wa very well. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, there were some quarters there for, you know, the government workers. So some of them could put their briefcases that they no longer need in, I mean, around their bolas or their, you know, waste bins and whatnot. I used to go there. I checked the ones that are okay. I pick them up, clean them, and I put my books inside and I use them to school. I didn't have a bicycle, but I was staying very far away from contact. So I used to walk. Yeah. There were instances where I would see my friends ride bicycles and then they come past me by and I felt like weeping. But there was nothing to do because my father could not afford it. So 
I, I endured all this, but all in all these things, I never left God. I was so hooked to God. That's why my friends were calling me pastor. Because back at the junior high school, I was even doing what we call morning devotion. Every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I used to mount the, you know, the assembly ground. And then in front of all the students, I would preach to them. Certain times, it would be messages that I had from the priest at church on Sunday. I come to preach it verbatim to my friends. And that motivated them. In fact, that has even led a lot to Christ. And today, people are giving accounts of their testimonies that, you know, they got through this kind of encounter. So it wasn't easy. There were times my mom had to always hit, you know, this TZ, the leftover one, the following day. That is what I ate and went to school. So that's why I'm saying that if you look at a person and look at where the person has got into, ask of the story behind the person's uh, life today. I went through a lot. And when I went to the university, the most tragic event of my life occurred in the first year, getting to the second year. I lost my father in 2010 who was my only benefactor, the only person who was supporting my education. My mother, Bruce Pito, and you know how much can Pito brewing, you know, oh. get somebody at least to support a child in the university. I alone know what happened, you know, I don't know what happened that I was able to graduate from the university and I never owed the university a single dime. So it is just the grace of God. It was a hard nut to crack, but I went through it with prayer, I saw something about you, or is it somebody who wrote something that when he was going to the school, somebody told him that prayer plus hard work equals to success. Yes, yes, it it's was me. the same motto. Yes, I was that was with. my motto. I remember one of my aunties, uh, Scholastica Yendao, she was a nurse before, now she's on retirement. She sent me to the station when I was going to Nandom Sec on her motorbike. She told me, my son, I am giving you this motto. Your, your motto should be success equals prayer plus hard work. And then I, I, I just keyed into it and made it like something that was part of my life. So when you see the life of Emmanuel, you will see prayer. Because at the secondary school, Nandom Sec, I was even known as a pastor because I used to pray. And I could, one thing about me was I could even pray in the Islamic language. So I had, I had the opportunity to move both the Islamic folks and the Christian folks. That is why when I stood as assistant, I mean, as senior high, I mean, senior prophet in Nandom Sec, I won it. But what happened was that the school wanted someone else to be the senior prophet because I was very small. If you look at my stature, I am a very young guy, small boy. So that was what happened. They gave it to one of my friends and they told me, this is what we want to do. And you would be the assistant. I didn't argue. I agreed and I took it. And I don't regret being the assistant senior prophet of Nandom Sec. So in fact, life was not rosy. It was not a, a, like a bed of roses for me. There were challenges I went through. And these are some of the challenges I went through in life. Ah, I got so emotional because... <laughs> Um, some of these challenges are very similar to everybody from um, less privileged background, especially where we come from. We, we basically face some of these challenges. And even the trend has not changed as of now. It is still the same story. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons why we want to share this story is that we want to tell the world that the African village child has potentials. Mm. They can be better off if they get a little support from the society. Mm. Mm. I got so emotional because it's, it's just very true. Even sometimes that uh, leftover teaser that you are talking about, you don't get it in the morning to eat before going to school. <laughs> That's right. You get to school and you are very hungry. Even the hunger alone, you cannot concentrate in classroom. That's right. And the trend has not changed for many African children. Children that are born from less privileged homes, mm. they continue to suffer the same situation. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that is what I always say. It is good that um, um, people don't just come to give us fish, but they teach us how to fish. That's right. 
And that is one of your story that we are looking at today because despite all the challenges, you have been able to make it. And sometimes mm. people come to Africa, they want to help the less privileged children. But mm. how sustainable is that help that you are giving to the youth? That's right. Is it something that will just give them food today and the next day they don't have future? Mm. Now, Doka is a lecturer, a whole lecturer, somebody who started from nothing. Mm. And these, these are some of the things that are still happening. There are children like that still suffering. And mm. so somebody give them, I think that daughter, you were lucky that you were born in well because uh, why is the uh, regional capital of Upper West? Do you know that mm. there are typical villages in Upper West that the situation is even worse than your case? Mm. <laughs> yeah. That's true. So it is never easy. In fact, you are a hero. You are not just a, you are, you are a big, big, big hero. We tangled. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think your life is uh, worthy of imitation. And I think all the viewers watching us, uh, sometimes African youth also think that when they see somebody being successful, they don't know how the person has started. They mm -hmm. think that maybe you have gone behind doors. They see you riding a very nice car. They don't even know how you have gotten that car. You have struggled before you have been able to get to where you are today. Yes. And so in life, if you want to make it, don't think of the easy way. You really have to suffer before you can enjoy. You can't just start enjoying like that. Mm. So, Doc, through that reflection of an African child celebrates you for your achievement and uh, where you are today. So, uh, mm. let's keep going. Mm. We want to go to the international. Uh, okay. How you got your scholarship to study at uh, Turkey. Yes. Okay. How did you get such a big opportunity? Thank, thank you so much. Yes. I always say one lesson uh, people can learn from my life is that your background is not a limitation. You should never let your background be a limitation to you. It is you, not the circumstances around you that determine what you make out of life. You know, as I told you, I am from a very poor background where even those days, chicken could only be eaten on Christmas days. In spite of all that, today I can say I am comfortable in life. So you asked me a very important question. How did I find myself in Turkey? I am the type that I am very inquisitive. I like to research. I, I like to search for things. So when I finished my national service as a teaching assistant at UDS Nabrongo campus, I told myself that, look, it is time for me to go and do postgraduate studies. And how do I do it? I knew that there was no way I could do masters. Be looking at where I'm coming from. Because I lost my father along the line when I was doing the bachelor program. So how would I be able to sponsor myself or, you know, do masters? It is not going to be possible. So I said I have to start looking for scholarships. Then I started applying. In fact, I spent most parts of my national service money on applying for scholarships. And this one, most of my friends were teasing me. They used to tell me that you are wasting your money. How do you go pay 100 cities, 200 cities for scholarship application fee, this, this, this? I said, look, I am looking for something and I need to invest into it. So I applied for a lot of scholarships. I got many of them, but then it was left onto me to make choices. I remember I got this, uh, you know, popular British Chevenin scholarship, you know, to go to the UK and study a one year master's in environmental geology. And then I got this scholarship to Turkey to study a two year master's in geological engineering to be followed with a PhD full scholarship for that. So when the two came, I told myself, my vision and dream in life is to become a lecturer. And for you to be a lecturer, you need a PhD. So why would I go to the UK, do the one year masters and have to come back to Ghana? Because that was their rule. 14 days after graduation, you need to come back to Ghana and then you have to practice what you have learned so that they will see that there is a benefit of what you learned from them to your people. But then for the Turkish own, there was no condition like that. You finish your masters. If you have very good grades, you continue with a PhD. If you finish, 
if you get a job there, you can work. If you don't get, and if you want to come back to your country or go anywhere, you can do. Then I looked at it. I was becoming a bit visionary about the whole situation. Number one, I want to be a lecturer. I want to be somebody having a PhD. So what should I do? So I had to go for the option that will give me PhD. The option that had PhD, because I cannot fund myself for PhD. So I went for the Turkish own. And how did I do it? I was searching on the internet. How did I get a scholarship? On the internet, I was just searching scholarships to Turkey, and I saw that there was Turkish government scholarship, of which today, Turkey gives about 6,000 scholarships to students from bachelor level to PhD level, the whole world, 6,000 scholarships. So I applied for the Turkish government scholarship and I got it. They called me for interview. It was just some simple things about myself. I was able to articulate myself and I got it. But the condition was that I had to study my program in Turkish, meaning I had to go and learn Turkish. So that was where the confusion came. And I said, no, let me see. They said there is another option, another Turkish scholarship. But this one is very competitive and they pick only like 200, 100 and something people across the whole world. Meaning it was too competitive and it was research based because it was given by their scientific and technological research council. So I said, let me dare it. So I tried it and then we waited for the outcome. One day I was in a uh, Facebook group with uh, the app other applicants and they were all saying the results were in. Everyone was saying, my name is not there. My name is not there. I was like, hey, so this poor boy from the Upper West region, will his name also be there? <laughs> then I went and checked the document and I saw my name number 14 out of 218 people across the whole world. And I was the only Ghanaian who was chosen. So my merriment was so infectious. I became so happy. I said, look, truly, God listens to the plea of a poor man. Because I didn't know how could I fund myself for masters, not to talk about PhD, but this one says masters and PhD. Then I, I, I started my, the process, got my visa, and then I went to Turkey. And then I studied my masters, finished the masters, and finished, uh, studied the PhD also, and then got this offer as a lecturer in UMAT. And I decided to come down. Because I believe that success, as I always say, is seeing a human need and being able to reach out to it. Success is not about accruing a lot of wealth, knowledge, and everything to yourself and not being able to affect people around you. That is not success. You are not a successful person. That is why the first president of Ghana, Osajipu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, ever said that the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it is linked up with the total liberation of the African continent. So if Ghana is independent, but the countries surrounding Ghana are not, then Ghana's independence is useless. So if I am liberated, now I have gotten higher education, I have my PhD, everything with me, and then I do not affect people around me, then my studies were useless. And then I said, no, let me come back to my country. A lot of people ask me, why did you come down to Ghana when there are better opportunities in Turkey and in Europe? I said, no, I want to come and help my people. And that is the reason why I came. And to the glory of God, the manifestations are coming out because my students are proud of me and I do my work with diligence. And that is how come God is sustaining me this far. So that is my journey in Turkey. Wow. I really saw that manifest manifestation on your Facebook page, profile page, uh, where I saw the citation from your student. Yes. Um, yes. So one of the reasons why doctor is telling us, sometimes some of us, African, we don't know that there are certain opportunities for us. You mm -hmm. just need to get a very good grade. I think if you need a scholarship to study abroad, you don't, you, they don't, I don't think you, uh, with second class lower, you can get scholarship abroad. You need to yes. get first class or second class if you want to study abroad. And so there are opportunities outside there. The only thing is that, as Doc said, you need to invest your time and energy. Yes, yes. And yes. also money. So whatever you desire for, you need to invest. He mentioned it. He said he invested a lot into this particular search before he got the scholarship. Yes. And so there are opportunities in the, around the world. 
in mm. Europe, around the world. You just need to sit down and invest. You need first, you need to have a very good class, upper class or first class before you can get scholarship. And so our doc said, he got the scholarship because he did very well and the opportunity came his way. Um, I want to add something to that. You just mentioned something. Many a times, it's not just only about academic performance or having very good grades. To get scholarships, your life should be balanced. That's why I always tell my students, we have three forms of lives. So I call them the, you have academic life, spiritual life, and social life. I call it the ass of a student, A-S-S, -S, the ass of a student, academic life social life, spiritual life. You should be able to balance them. So in most of these scholarships, when you are applying, they want to see whether there is a balance. Is it just only about academics? If you just send only your first class, whatever, sometimes they may not even give you the scholarship. They will prefer to give a scholarship to somebody who has second class upper, but has held a lot of leadership positions before. And maybe has done some researches and whatnot. Even sometimes they give scholarship to second class lower degree holders because they have had balance of life, not only about academics, they have held a lot of positions back at the university and maybe when they even came out of the university. So it, it's not for fun. When you go to the university and people are, you know, holding positions, SRC days or whatever, prayer days or whatever in their church or in their mocks. No, take good note of all those things. Add them to your CVs get uh, uh how do you call it? certificates for me i was one person what any level of education i went to i had a lot of positions i was holding in fact in nandom sec alone i held more than 10 positions wow and all of them i had certificates for them christian students association i was the vice president catholic charismatic renewal president catholic youth organization president environment and wildlife club president debaters club vice president and i was the debater for the school assistant senior prophet i held all these positions and i got certificates for them and i made sure i incorporated them into my cv then when i went to the university the same thing when i held positions in my church positions in my social life and then positions in other aspects of life i added all of them to my cv and i made sure i did well also i had a second class upper i didn't get first class i had second class upper so you see, but with the second class upper, I was able to get this full scholarship for master's and PhD. Uh -huh. Wow. I hope we have heard what Doc has said and you need to have a balanced life. I've learned something today, ASS. -A yes. Uh, it is very good and interesting to know this and everything you need to balance your spiritual life, your academic life, and then your social life. Very good, interesting to learn this from you this evening. Um, I would like to know what do you actually lecture at the University of Mines and Technology? And also tell us a little bit what that interesting citation from your students. Okay, all right, thank you so much. Yeah, so I am a lecturer at the Geological Engineering Department of UMAT. So at UMAT, I teach Geological Engineering and basically, I teach courses related to my area of expertise. I am a geochemist. Okay. So I deal with the geochemical, you know, composition of earth materials like soil, rocks, minerals, water. And uh, more recently, my researches are focused on groundwater pollution, groundwater contamination, especially in the northern part of Ghana. I have had a lot of publications close to 25 publications and web of science index journals you know related to this uh, problem especially in the upper east region we realize that there is high amount of fluoride in the water and because of that if you care to know most of our brothers our slaves yes. i always call them our yes. slaves you yes. see that it's yellowish yes yes they don't know yes. Resolution. Sometimes they ascribe it to, you know, ancestral things or superstitious beliefs and whatnot. They say their ancestors had these same teeth and they came, they are also having the same teeth. It is not spiritual. It is geological. And how is it geological? 
the rocks in the area popularly known as the bongo granitoids these are granitic rocks they contain minerals that have high amount of fluoride in them these minerals are called micas so the fluoride in them is preferentially released into the water because water is interacting with rock you see when you drill a borehole you have to hit a rock to get the water so the water and the rock they are interacting and the rock contains the minerals that have fluoride in them then these minerals will release the fluoride into the water water has its natural composition of fluoride below 1.5 milligrams per liter now if excess fluoride is added what do you think will happen it will exceed its maximum threshold the 1.5 and and well health organization tells us that if fluoride in groundwater exceeds 1.5 milligram per liter when you drink it you will have what we call dental mottling or dental fluorosis where you begin to see your teeth look yellowish you are not smoking but you see your teeth yellowish and this one it is difficult to treat in other parts of the world it can lead to what we call skeletal fluorosis where the bones of the children become very weak and their legs become bow-legged if you go to pakistan and india most of the asian countries they have this problem but we thank god the situation we only have is the minor one which is dental fluorosis but it is so you know the discouraging or you know self-demeaning when you see that you have that in you you lose some kind of confidence in yourself uh -huh. so that is what i have been doing so these days i look into that and i try to also assess the impact of the drinking of the water on the health of the people so i can know whether there are some carcinogens or cancer causing uh, contaminants in the water and i can advise them so with this sometimes you have to know the, the age of the people and then their body weight the amount of water they drink a day then you use united states environmental protection agency's model to do the uh, estimation to know whether the people are prone to any health effect or not so basically these are the kind of things i i teach uh -huh. and now yes i came to umat last year as a lecturer so i've not even reached one year because i came last semester and i was giving my first project students uh which there were about eight in the whole department i supervised the highest number of students and i did it to the best of my knowledge and the way i could support them looking at the blend of you know environments i came through from a very you know uh, disadvantaged university uds where we didn't even have equipment like umat has but I was able to, you know, make it. And when I went to take it, I learned and then I made it. So when I came, I said, no, these students, some of them were very weak, but I transformed them into people that are valuable. They even became best in their class. Why? Because I, I helped them. We generated project topics. Then what I started doing was guiding them every two weeks. I tell my students, we are going to have presentation progress presentation every two weeks come and tell me what you did so far and what you'll be doing in the next two weeks so that put the students on their toes and they were learning so they had mastery over their work and when they went to defend their thesis to the glory of god everybody saw it how my students were so confident and in fact they were adjudged as the best students for that particular semester of graduating students and so that is how come the students themselves saw that the thing was so in, inciting, it helped them. I don't know what happened. They brought a citation to me that they want to thank me for wow. dedicating my time to them and helping them become the best and then bringing the best out of them. And in fact, that moved me. I was teary. I said, look, even if the vice chancellor gives me a, an award, I will not value it more than the award the students have given to me. So that is all about that citation wow thank you very much it's, it's, your story is really touching i'm getting so emotional about everything and uh, mm -hmm. you are really doing well thank you for the impact that you are making on young african youth i know mm -hmm. this will go a long way these children that you are really supporting their lives are going to be better off and they will get more exposure maybe uh, better than what you have even gotten that's right mm. thank you viewers joyce i've seen you clement i've seen you solomon thank you robert thank you 
Kobe, thank you for joining. Thank you, everyone. Princess, I've seen you. Thank you for joining. Fidelis, thank you for joining. Nancy, thank you for joining. I've thank, thank you, everyone, for joining this program. You are the reason why the program is on. And uh, it is still life here. I have with me doctor, and he's telling us more. In fact, he was even lecturing us uh, certain things that we didn't know about what the issue about water in the Upper East region. And it's quite you know, interesting to know all those stuff. Um, we want to know, hmm. uh, studying in the international world, coming abroad to study both masters and PhD, hmm. what were some of the challenges? What were your experience studying in the international class with people from different backgrounds? What were your experiences? Yeah, that's, that's right. Thank you so much. In fact, there were a lot of challenges. Uh, this is a country I went to of which I didn't understand their language. Turkey, they speak Turkish. The Turkish people speak Turkish. And this Turkish is a blend of almost all the languages in the world. So we have a touch of French, a touch of Arabic, a touch of Chinese, a whole lot of languages put together, Italian language and whatnot. So one of my challenges was the language. How to understand these people? My program was actually being taught in English. But the issue is that these lecturers come, they are struggling to speak the English to you. So it was more of a big challenge to me. So I had to become more like an extrovert. You know, anybody who knows me, I like to talk. So I mingled myself with the locals and I picked up the language. And that was no longer a challenge to me. So I learned their language without even going to the classroom. People went to the classroom to learn their language before starting their programs. You must get advanced level certificate. I didn't get any of that, but I learned the language on the street. And today, the language I speak, the Turkish I speak, is even better than that of those who went to the classroom to learn it. And, and that is a wonder to many people. So number one, the language was a big problem. And then in the class, I realized I was the only black doing <laughs> masters in geological engineering. I was the only black in the class. And you know, these people, some have never seen a black before in their life, only on television. Some of the funny questions they asked me were, in your country, do you people sleep on trees, on top of trees? Oh. That we heard there are no homes, there are no houses. You sleep on top of trees, you live with animals. And then some of the stupid questions, excuse me to use that word, some of the questions they asked me were, don't you have universities in Ghana that you have to come to uh, Turkey to learn? So some of these questions were so, you know, annoying, but I had to bear it like that. There were instances when somebody asked me such a question. What I would say is that in my country, I'm the weakest student and there is no university in Ghana that will accept me. So it is only your country's university that can accept me. That is how come I came here. <laughs> then when I say that, I silence them like that. Aha. So the, the language was a barrier. And then, you know, integrating with the people, it was a big problem. There was some form of racism, minor racism. In fact, these people are not much of racist because they have human beings at heart. Today, I can say it for a fact that Turkish have humanity at heart. It is only because most of them are not exposed. They don't travel outside. So when they see you first as a black, they may have some bad, you know, understanding of who you are because they watch movies and they are seeing black people doing bad and evil things. So they think you are like that. But then when they watch you and then they see that you are not like that. For instance, my supervisor confessed to me, that Emmanuel, I see that you are very resolute. When you say this, that is it. You will never change your mind. If you want to do something, you go for it. And then he said that was something that was so motivating to him. So the class students didn't want to come closer to me in a way, but I proved to them that, look, the black man can come to your country and become the best. So when we wrote our first exams, the results came, and I was the overall best. Because most of my courses... I had A, 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 A. I said most, all my courses, if I show you my transcript, I never had a single B. All my courses were A, A, A. And we had a GPA system for the master's, GPA system out of four. And I had four out of four. Because all my courses were 100%, 98, 95, there was nothing below 90. 
which means everything was AA. And I had a GPA of four out of four. That is first class. If there is even anything beyond first class, that was what I had for my master's. Then I went to the PhD, the same thing. They were using CWA system, and I had 96.69%, which is also first class because everything was AAAA. I never had a single B. So these people, they were not interested in learning the nationals of Turkey. But we, the foreigners, when we went there, we realized that, look, you are not in your country, so you have to learn. If you want to have a better living, because sometimes I look at my back, where I'm coming from. That's why I always say, never forget the home, where you are coming from. I realized that I had a lot of burden on me. I told you I lost my father in the year 2010. My mother is only a pito brewer. I have three sisters following me, and I'm the firstborn. How were they going to survive? Who would take care of them? So I had to strike forward, and I made the best. So that's why I always say my life, one of the key lessons people can learn from my life is be the best at what you do. Be the best. One attribute that stands me out is excellence. Be the best. If you find something to do, try to be the best. I, in fact, when it comes to that, I can always say I will pride over it. I will say I am the best to do this thing. If something comes and they want somebody to do it, I tell them I can do it. And I dare it and I do it. For instance, when I was in school, I was one of the best students in my class. From, you know, day nursery to the university level. I represented my school at, you know, uh, higher levels. For instance, at St. Andrews Junior High School in the year 2003, I addressed the whole of Ghana on the Ghana National Television, GTV, during Christmas time. They came, they interviewed me, they selected one person from the Upper West region. And because of my vocality uh, or the way I speak, it all started from that. So they chose me as the ultimate person. And I addressed the whole of Ghana. So I was shocked when I went to places. Oh, we saw you in the television. You were talking this, this. So these were some of the things I, I, I went through. And then when I went to Nandom Sec, the same thing, I was selected as the best, among the best 200 for Coca-Cola National Essay Writing Competition. And I went to Accra for the award and whatnot. So be the best at whatever you find to do. Don't underrate yourself. Needless to say, the successes that I have currently even chalked as a lecturer at UMAT are another pointer to this fact that I am always the best at whatever I do. Then one thing I can leave you with also is you must remain humble. Humility counts. You can sometimes talk about how you have gone through life or what you have achieved in life, but be sometimes sober and gentle about it. Be humble, respect people. You know, I believe impregnably that I am a total example of humility. One thing I do is, if I meet a child and I meet an adult, the way I treat you is the same way I treat everybody. I tell my wife even, the way I treat you is, sometimes there are certain things I can do to you that I will not do to others. But in terms of respect, I respect everybody equally. Because I believe that one day, one day, I may need something from that person. And then another thing is, invest in people. I have learned a lesson in life that investing in people will always help you in the long run. Actually, when you invest in people, they will go any land for you. They can stand for you. These students that have given me citations, today they become future leaders or they become managers of bigger minds. And you think if my son needs a job somewhere, they would not want to link my son to that job. Or if they are in a higher position to help my son, you think they would not want to do that. So I have invested my life, you know, and my resources to several lives, to several people, to the point that I have lost count of my mentees. I've lost count of people that are mentoring. I've always defined, like I told you, success as seeing a human need and being able to reach out to it. So I have connected many people to several opportunities abroad for further studies, some of which I have even personally supported. Yes. So it's not about me alone going to study. I have. If you go to my university currently in Turkey, all the Ghanaians there, they went there through me and my wife. And we are currently about 11 Ghanaians in that university. Uh -huh. And then I even went further. Other countries, friends from Nigeria, the first postgraduate student in my university from Nigeria, I was the one who gave him the opportunity there. And he also started bringing a lot of Nigerians. 
So I even became the president of the African Students Union in the university. Wow. And I was the founding father because I saw the need for it and I started it. Uh -huh. So these are the few things I can share with you about my life. Wow. Thank you very much, Doc. Your yeah. story is really inspiring. And I, I think that all the viewers are inspired about what we are hearing, what you have done and what you are still doing. Continue to be that support for many African youth, uh, yeah. especially the less privileged people that are struggling to be where you are, to get yeah. some opportunities that you have gotten and you are giving them support. Continue to yeah. give that support to them as well as your student that you are giving a lot of impact. Thank and you. through the reflection of an African child celebrates you for this great achievement. Mm. Uh, you really have done better than what you are doing now. And I think you can do your best and the sky is definitely not the mm. limit for you. Mm. Uh, mm. I have seen you, lovely viewers. Sister Essa, I have seen you. Connie, I have seen you. Thank you for joining. Adam, I have seen you. Uh, you have, if I have not mentioned your name, means that I have forgotten or I haven't seen well. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining. I want yes. to ask something. You mentioned yes. that you have three sisters. I want yes. to hear about uh, those your three sisters. What okay. support have you given to them? Wow. Thank you so much. That's a very nice question. Yes. Well, yes. In fact, I cannot be blessed and I allow my sisters to be beggars or to be suffering in life. So I have tried my best to give them all the opportunities that are at my disposal. So the one that follows me currently is even in the university at UDS WAP. Yes, she has almost finished. She, I think the, she has presented her thesis and whatnot. So she's finished. And then the one that follows her is also in Turkey. I sent her to Turkey. She's currently entering third year. Next month, she'll be going to third year and she's studying genetic engineering. In fact, this is something I want to tell people. This was a lady who uh, did general arts at the secondary school level. She went to Our Lady of Providence and she read general arts, but today she has found herself doing science, not just science, engineering, and one of the difficult courses, genetic engineering, and she's doing well. So that's why I always say that, look, if you find an opportunity in a person, you can nurture the person up and the person will grow to like or be what you want the person to be. Because I sent her to UDS, she was reading actuarial science, which is more like statistics and math combined. And then I helped her to get a scholarship to Turkey. So she had finished one year at UDS, but I said, no, you've gotten a scholarship, go. It's better to go outside and experience things for yourself. If you keep yourself well, then you can come back to your country. And when we applied and it was a science program, people were like, no, she will not get admission. Said, Let's wait and see. Because she did well, they gave her admission. And today she's doing well in the program. She even went with people who somehow also, you know, did science. They even did science. She didn't do science. And they were even left over because they failed some courses and they stopped their scholarships. But to the glory of God, she's still on it. So I've helped her also. And then the third one who is currently in the junior high school, she's in an international school. And I take care of her as well. And I believe that she would also grow to love science because... I believe that science is the master of the world. Thank you very much. Um, I got emotional about what you said. Um, the world, and there are so many organizations that are trying to fight poverty in Africa. Yes. And I always say in my own opinion that if NGOs we decide or try to help at least mm -hmm. every first child and the firstborn of every needed family, mm -hmm. then the whole family will be safe. And mm. in a way, it can the, the poverty level in Africa can reduce. That's right. Because many of us from very poor background, our parents have not gotten education. And so, like it depends. For instance, my case is the same thing. It depends on until somebody from the family is able to make it through mm -hmm. education or entrepreneurship and save the rest of the siblings, life will never change. That is it. That is it. You are if right. not because you have been able to make it, your siblings would have still been in Upper West. Maybe they wouldn't have even gotten anywhere. 
maybe they would have even been impregnated by someone and that is the I'm end of it. I'm telling you, I have seen this trend. I've seen that people that maybe their first child or somebody have been able to pull out from the family. Then you see that the whole life, the, everybody life in the family changes at once. Mm. Like hunger and their way of living, everything gets better. Mm. And so the, sometimes these are the situation, but they, they, in, in Africa, there are still situations that in a whole family, nobody have gotten any formal education, nobody have gotten any skill. So the generational poverty continues in that manner. And there mm -hmm. is no help, there is no support, nothing. Mm -hmm. Because it was fortunate that you were staying in work. There are typical villages in, in, in Upper West Region there that they, 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 they don't get that opportunity that or that kind of exposure that you had. In mm -hmm. fact, you were living by a uh, low cost. Low cost mm -hmm. is known to be an area where rich people live. Mm -hmm. And so even that alone can give you some kind of exposure. Mm -hmm. Talking about somebody that is living in a very typical village, you don't even see any car, you don't see anything, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. Mm. So these are some of the challenges. And so one way is that this uh, truly reflection of Africa, I want to tell the world that the African people born from less privileged homes have potentials. Mm. Sometimes mm. we don't get the exposure and the opportunities that we need to get to where we are. Yes. Uh, mm. Doc, yes. you are truly a, a great African child. And Thank by your you. achievement, the world will continue to celebrate you. I'm yes. sure I'm not the only one. Greater, greater is yet to come, uh, or greatest is yet to come your way Amen. because Amen. you have just started work, and I know that there, there is going to be a lot of achievement. You are going to make a lot of impact in Ghana, and the Amen. world will definitely celebrate you more. Amen. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Yes. I'm really touched by the story that you have shared with us, and I know and the viewers are attached. In fact, today you are the, the first person that have gotten the highest viewership because yeah. I've gotten like 30, more than 30 viewership on live program. And yeah. it means that people really wanted to hear your story and they wanted to listen to you. Viewers, yeah. we appreciate you. We thank you for joining. I've seen you all for your contribution, the messages that you have sent. I appreciate everything. Thank you for being part of the program. Mm -hmm. So your last way to do it, and then maybe people that are looking for opportunity to study abroad. Okay. Yes. So let me take the last part. People who are looking for opportunities to study abroad. Perhaps you have a degree or you have a certificate and you want to further it up. What I want to say is that most of us are looking for jobs and not for opportunities. So our certificates and degrees are actually preparing graduates to look for jobs and not opening up their eyes to life-changing opportunities. So you are not poor because you don't have a job. You are poor because you are not seeing and seizing opportunities. Let me tell you, my definition of poor is being poor is simply passing over opportunities repeatedly. P-O-O-R. Passing over opportunities repeatedly passing oh. over opportunities repeatedly it's not like that is the end of life for you no seize the opportunities available to you if you want scholarship to study abroad and you know somebody has made it consult the person how did you do it let's go to the bible the bible says that when mary you know was pregnant and she couldn't bear it. She realized that her cousin Elizabeth was also pregnant before. So what did she do? She had to rise to go and ask Elizabeth, this thing that you are going through, I'm also going through similar thing. How did, did you manage to even go through it? Because yours is ahead of me. So you must all find your Elizabeths in life. I was able to sail through, maybe I didn't find an Elizabeth, but I am the type that is very daring. So I was able to make it. So I could become an Elizabeth to somebody. So if you want opportunities in life to go and study abroad and whatnot, some of us are there. 
others who have gone outside and studied, consult them. For me, I share opportunities on social media and on you know the WhatsApp groups I'm in. Sometimes I share these kind of scholarship opportunities with people. So if you don't tell people your need, nobody will know what you need. Tell people what you need, and then they will what help you out. So what keeps people ahead in life is not their education or degrees. One thing to you have to get that. It is simply the opportunity that they seized. You see, I seized the opportunity and maximized it. When I went to Turkey, I maximized it. And today, it, it, it is paying off for me. Jobs may be scarce, but not opportunities. Jobs may be scarce, but opportunities are not scarce. There are a lot of scholarships, opportunities to go and study abroad. Sometimes, if you maybe you did your master's, and then you want to go and do PhD, but your master's was not so good. So you, you, you still want to travel abroad to study. You can use your bachelor degree, go for another master's. When you are there, you can make them know you have a master's degree. I'm telling you, they can even upgrade you and make you a PhD candidate. These are some of the strategies people are using to go outside. Uh -huh. So don't throw one level away and just base on your current level, which is not even good to help you get a scholarship. You can go back and take your former level, get the level that you are currently at. When you are there to study, make them know you have this. And then they have seen you and they know your input. Then they can consider you for further studies or further levels of the academia. Yes. So that is a seize the opportunities. And one that what I want to tell everybody, all the viewers, everyone that has you know viewed this, I actually appreciate you. Thank you so much for connecting. In fact, this is one of the things that I love to do to help people tell people my story. Because maybe some people may have heard of me, but they don't know how I got to that level. This is how I got to it. And you can also make it have confidence in yourself. That is why I said my life is imbued with four major lessons. What are they? Number one, your background is not a limitation. The second one is that be the best at what you do. And then the third one, as I said, remain humble. Humility will take you to places. Humility will take you to places. And then the fourth one is invest in people. Invest in people. Any opportunity you get, seize it and bring people to it. You alone, when you benefit it and you don't want others to benefit, then you are not visionary. You don't think about generations to come. That's why I always say my children to come will benefit from people that have mentored or have given them opportunities. So see the opportunities, invest into other people, and then you can relax at a point in life where God will say, well done, thou good and faithful server. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Doc. Our background is definitely not a limitation. Yes. And we are making it just that sometimes some of the little ones that uh, when we look back, those are the villages and still they are yes. struggling to come out. And definitely our background is not our limitation because uh, sometimes we don't get the opportunity. But when the opportunities come our way, we seize mm -hmm. them and make use of them. Yes. And so Doc is telling us this evening that Make use of the opportunities that come your way. Thank you very, very much for this program. Thank you for sharing what you have shared with us. I'm really inspired, and I know the viewers as well. The contribution, the messages are coming in. A lot are flowing. After this program, please try to respond to some like and all that you can do. Thank you very much, Doc. I appreciate you, and I know the viewers as well. Have Thank a you. good evening. Thank and you so much. Much. But how yes. did you get me? How did you get me? One question I have to ask you. Ah, I don't know how I got you, but I don't know I you, got you to do the, the citation, the citation that your students wrote to you. Wow. I think you, you have been my Facebook friend, though, yes. but yes. I don't know you, something mm -hmm. like that. Me but too, I, I got you. the citation and I read through and I, okay, I got interested in to know more about you and all that. Wow. Wow. Yes, yes, that's, yes. Right. That's yes. Great. Thank you. So, so thank much. you very much. Very yes. Much. And I look forward to more of these opportunities. Yes, yes. I would like to have more programs with you, and yes. we will plan about that. Thank you very much. For now, our time is gone. Okay. 
Lovely viewers, I thank you for joining. I appreciate you so much. See you in our next video. And bye for now. Bye. God bless you. Bye.